Welcome, future masters. This is a great example of visualization in the end game. So I wanted to show you this little quick problem, not a big deal. Well, it's relative. As you see, it took me 35 seconds, and that was only because I spent a few seconds thinking, do I want to start the recording before I finish it? i just finish it, you know, and then record it. So he comes up with this move. So this is an example of a couple of things. One, position evaluation. One of the things that you have to recognize to be successful in this position is how can the knight affect the pawns. So black has a threat of king takes pawn, obviously. But really the thing that came to my mind to concern me was how can he mess with me? So I said, well, let's just go the brute force technique is a tr tremendous technique. The brute force technique t is basically take the most obvious thing and go with it and analyze and see where it goes. And that is push the A pawn, the passer. Push the, the passer with the king not in front of it. This is also a passed pawn. So A5, well, he's gonna have to go like knight to E5 with an idea to check me. So A5, knight E5, A6 check and then he's starting to generate some you know if, if i he's threatening to go to possibly b8 or also if i go king to b7 knight to c5 check sacrificing so these are all possibilities and then i said well you know the problem he's gonna have is is in getting to that rook file if i anticipate where to go and the knight to d7 idea is the correct idea but i have a way to stop that or he can go knight to e7 there's a way to stop that as well so if i go a5 knight to e7 he's already starting to check and it's like yeah whatever a6 you know he's threatening to do checks on me i'm like you know whatever but this is the deal there's another rule that comes into play that helps to determine what you're doing and that is knights are notoriously bad against rook pawns so my gut my gut reaction of pushing the pawn with the brute force technique shows a lot of promise without having to do too much calculation combining that with the rule that knights are have a tough time stopping rook pawns it's like you know what i don't need this b pawn my a pawn is good enough to win. Okay, we're going to redo this. This is what he played. So, A5 is the move. He plays king takes pawn. Yeah, whatever, dude. A6, come get some. He plays knight to E7. This is the thing that I saw in my visualization was when he played knight to e7 we get to use a very little used idea and it comes from the idea of bishop versus knight domination and you're asking you're probably asking yourself what is this crazy guy talking about there's no bishops around here stupid that's correct there's no bishops here but this is what separates the men from the boys. I do have half a bishop. You're like, what? There's no bishops here. That's right. I have half a bishop. I'm like, and you're and you're probably thinking this guy's out of his mind. He's finally gone over the edge. This dude doesn't have a bishop. Number one, and that even if he did, he still doesn't have half a bishop. How do you have half a bishop? I'm about to show you. It's quite clever half a bishop i have half a bishop because now if you know about bishop and knight domination if white had a bishop a light square bishop that bishop would dominate the knight on the square of h7 right here because that bishop would guard g8 g6 and f5 and these two don't count because the knight doesn't reach those the knight reaches g8 g6 and f5 so a bishop on h7 would stop him 
from going to the right. If we had a bishop on e4, it would cover g6, f5, d5, and c6. That knight could not move anywhere except to the back rank. If I had a bishop on b7, that would stop him from going to c8, c6, or d5. So, I don't have a bishop, but when I play the correct move, I'm going to guard c8 and c6, half of a bishop. Now, the bishop with the full bishop would guard d5 and e4, but I don't need those squares guarded. All I need is my king to give me half of what the bishop would stop this knight for if I had bishop to b7. So I don't have bishop to b7, I have king to b7. And voila, French word, I own half of the squares that bishop would own. This is a half of a bishop against this knight only. Against the knight on e7, this is, in effect, half of a bishop. I guard this square like a bishop. I guard this square like a bishop. I don't need to guard the bishop's other squares. They're worthless. Now, I'm not only am I half of a bishop on b7, I'm also on the shepherd square, which means his king cannot stop my pawn. So, my half bishop stops the knight from messing with me, and my king on the shepherd square stops the king from messing with my pawn. <laughs> you lose, buddy. King to b7, double exclamation. This was the move I saw in my visualization. Not rocket science. Pawn to a8 equals queen, you lose. So in this case, half a bishop is better than none. And that's how I got the title for this video. Pretty awesome, huh? Like I said, you know, you saw it was like 35 seconds. And that was because I vacillated for a few seconds thinking, eh, do I do it live or just do it after the fact? Because I could see it coming already. So I did it after the fact. But this is the key. So and if you didn't know this, like I said, when I showed you about the bishop, the bishop dominates the knight. In this, on e7, a bishop on b7, e4, or h7 would dominate the knight, depending on what you need to dominate. It's two squares in between the bishop and the knight. So I saw king b7 was coming as a killer move. Just an absolutely killer move. And when you see this coming, I don't need the b-pawn. So, hopefully... This has been a really good endgame lesson. Not too difficult once I explained it. You'd feel pretty confident yourself. So, hope you enjoyed it. It was pretty fun. So, like the video. It'll help out a lot. You guys know what you're doing. It's pretty cool. I'll see you guys later.